Thank you very much for, for being here, uh, both here in person and those of us who are joining by live stream, YouTube, uh, and the like. Uh, my name is Neil Safir. I am the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies as of July 1st. Um, I'm very excited because this is our first public event. And uh, in addition to introducing our co-sponsors of the event, uh, uh, I'm, I'm also uh, will have the chance to introduce our first um, visiting professors, all of our visiting professors actually who are here as well. Uh, we are thrilled uh, today to be partnering for this event with the LGBTQT Plus Center here at Brown. Um, I'm going to be introducing uh, the director of that uh, center, Caitlin O'Neill, in just a moment. Um, but before I do that, I would very much like to thank uh, various people who have done a lot to uh, make sure that this event could happen. Um, in the first uh, instance, I would like to thank uh, Eliza Holstein, who is our interim center manager um, and who has uh, done an amazing amount in a very short period of time to bring this event to fru fruition. Uh, as if on cue, our former center manager, Kate Goldman, um, who also did a lot to bring this event uh, to fruition. Um, as well as the entire Watson staff and crew, from Alex Laferriere to Ellen White to Annette Agunike and many others who have assisted and really come out of the woodwork to support us. Um, I would also like to thank uh, outgoing CLACS director Patsy uh, Lewis for her support and help in organizing this and other events that we've had at, uh, or that we will have at CLAX this year. Um, and uh, a shout out to our two student workers, uh, Veronica Godina and Cayetana Jaramillo for their support and assistance as well. I will also say that we will be having an event um, in a week from today, a film screening in this very room, uh, which is co-sponsored co by the Institute of Brown for Environment and Society as part of a consumable commodities event series. Um, this will be a film uh, and discussion of soilism, about soy production in the world, but also especially in and around Latin America. It will be followed by another event on November 20th, which is entitled, um, a, a, a film screening which is entitled Que les paso a las abejas? What happened to the bees? About uh, beekeeping in Mexico and the relationship between um, indigenous uh, and mestizo workers and um, the production of bees. Uh, finally, it's my pleasure to welcome publicly our CLAX visiting professors for this year, starting with Augustine Diez Fischer, um, who is an art historian from the University of Buenos Aires, who has done work on Leon Ferrari and, uh, and rhetoric. In fact, if you have a free moment tomorrow at noon, he's giving a talk in the Hispanic Studies Department about as far as you can possibly get on the Brown campus from this room. Uh, 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 84 Prospect Street, and um, we'll be giving a talk about his uh, research. Uh, he is here with us for the entire academic year. We are also very, very thrilled to uh, announce the arrival of Sabine Lemour uh, from uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Um, today is her first official day as CLAX visiting researcher. Uh, uh, if you get a chance, yes, it actually deserves <laughs> an incredible round of applause. If you get a chance, ask her how she actually came to be here, her, her parable, périple, to uh, receive her, um, her visa. Uh, we're thrilled to have her. Um, she is a researcher um, who works on um, feminism in Haiti. This is uh, one of the uh, co-edited volumes that she, has uh, that she has written, Déjouer le silence. Um, and uh, in her own contribution to this work, she sustains a thesis that Migrant women who work outside of Haiti to support their families are anchored socio-politically more in their country of origin than in the country to which they have traveled. So it's looking at this kind of cross, um, cross-cultural and cross-political and social transformations. We're looking forward. We'll have other events coming up that she will um, that will be focused around her and her work. 
Um, and finally, Kamala Kempadu, uh, who is uh, the uh, organizer of this event today. Um, I'm also a sociologist of Guyanese and Barbadian extraction, professor emerita of social science at York uh, University, um, whose most recent work, um, I believe, uh, is, a, is a collection entitled Methodologies in Caribbean Research on Gender and Sexuality. <laughs> no? No. The book. <laughs> well. Sorry. But that was that was co co created, yeah, 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 yeah. right? Were you you were part of that? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> With Elena Shin, she here here pre, here present, um, and uh, in fact, in this very room, uh, we uh, we presented that. Uh, that book uh, and as part of CLACS. Um, Kamala was the COGIT visiting professor in spring 2021 and is now back here um, for the 2023 um, uh, sem fall semester. Finally, it's now my pleasure to pass the baton to Caitlin O'Neill, who's the director of the LGBT TQ Center here, um, an adjacent, uh, uh, rather adjunct faculty in the Department of American Studies. Um, they joined Brown in 2019 as assistant director of the center and na was named director in 2022. Um, I can say all of us at CLACS are thrilled to be holding this event in collaboration uh, with all of you at the center. Um, and you also have the center to thank uh, the LGBTQ Center, that is, to thank for the reception afterwards, which I very cordially invite you to join us for. So with that, um, I leave things to Caitlin, and thank you again all for your presence here. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin O'Neill, and I'm the director of the LGBTQ Center, um, also lovingly known as Stonewall House. And it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you, especially um, since I happen to know um, two of the panelists very well and have known Nick for some time now, and I love him very much. So extremely excited about the release of his new book. Um, publishing a book is a fantastic accomplishment, and this is a wonderful opportunity to celebrate Nick's book and um, Preeti's upcoming release with all of you, and to have the space and time to delve more deeply into their work and the significant impact their work will continue to have in fields of gender and sexuality studies and Caribbean studies. The people who shared their stories with Nick and Preeti, black and brown queer people from the Caribbean, are still so rarely recognized as the authors of their own experiences, as agents capable of theorizing their own lives. I'm deeply thankful for the ways that Nick and Preeti's scholarship refutes this by working alongside the communities they write about and how that work honors the depth, breadth, and beauty of queer Caribbean life. In times like these, there's a certain degree of precarity for those of us who are queer and trans and those who work in gender and sexuality studies. As director of the LGBTQ Center, my work is centered around supporting students at the undergraduate, graduate, and medical levels through providing space, resources, programming, and campus advocacy efforts that enable our students to not only be successful personally, but also academically, and to thrive. At a time when LGBTQ centers and diversity, equity, and inclusion offices are being closed or restructured across the country, I'm able to say that today marks almost a day to the year that Brown moved us out of the first space our center had ever known since 2004, a small two-room um, suite tucked away in the third story of Fonts House or the Stephen Robert 62 Campus Center, it's like a sister building to this one, um, and uh, moved us into a beautifully renovated two-story home at 22 Benevolent Street. So we are not very far from here, but it's um, extremely exciting for us. Again, I think the University of, Te uh, University of Houston just closed their LGBTQ center. Um, so really, there are a lot of spaces that um, we don't know how much longer they're going to last, how long it'll be until we see them kind of pop back up again in certain places. So it's really astounding to have Brown um, pouring money and resources and support into the work that I do and into work like this um, when a lot of institutions are doing the opposite. I'm also able to say that we employ two full-time professional staff members, seven hourly undergraduates, a graduate and medical student coordinator. If you're a graduate medical student, it's here today. We also provide programming for you as well. Um, and um, 15 students between our gender and sexuality peer counselors program and the Disability Justice Student Initiative, both of which are shared between us and the Sarah Dwell Center for Women and Gender and the assistant director, which is here right now. Hi, Madison. Um, 
And I just invite and encourage you to follow our work by, you can always go to brown.edu slash LGBTQ, where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter, or our Instagram, which is, um, the, our handle is the.lgbtq.center. And if you're a student and you're looking for community or more opportunities to engage with topics of gender and sexuality, then I invite you to visit us at Stonewall House. Again, it is beautiful. Uh, the house was built, took between 1816 and 1823 to be built. We're the oldest house on the block, but we're the cutest as of right now. <laughs> um, and really there are multiple opportunities actually weekly for exactly that, coming together, making community, um, and getting to talk more about exactly what you'll be hearing about today. And if you're staff or faculty, then you'll find that we host or collaborate on events much like this one that are open to the wider Brown community, from academic discussions to panels of experienced experts, like the one we had um, just in September for parents and caregivers of trans and non-binary youth. And um, two events that we have happening actually this Friday and Saturday. So Friday evening at 7 p.m. in Solomon Auditorium, we're working with the Sarah Doyle Center for Women and Gender and also the School of Public Health. Um, to bring scholar artist Kareem Kubchandini, also known as Lahore Bajistan, um, for Lessons in Drag, a performance that explores decolonial theory through drag. And it's gonna be fantastic. Kareem is um, a great scholar, but also a great performer. And I've actually never seen Lahore Bajistan, so um, I've only seen him give academic talks. So this will be a nice kind of in between. Um, and on Saturday at 11 a.m. in Pembroke 305, which is also very far from this room, we'll be hosting a book and brunch with Kareem, where we'll serve brunch and discuss his new book, Decolonizing Drag, as part of OR Books' new series, Decolonize That, Handbooks for the Revolutionary Overthrow of Colonial Ideas, edited by Bhakti um, Sringapur. So if you have any further questions about anything I've talked about um, today, I invite you to reach out to me either at lgbtq at brown.edu or approach me after the panel during today's reception. And I'd like to end by thanking the Center for Latin American Studies for collaborating with us, and especially our esteemed visiting professor, Kamala Kempadu, for reaching out to partner with the LGBTQ Center in a meaningful way to make space for this engaging and profoundly impactful work. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's great to have these two scholars here today, and um, I would really like to thank the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and the, L and the Stonewall Center, <laughs> LGBTQ Center, um, and Caitlin for hosting this, for integrating it into my class. I'm teaching this class on Caribbean feminisms, and we have a component on sexualities, and this is a, an important part of it. I'm really excited to have uh, Dr. Kumar and Dr. Atai here today, um, because I've known them for several years. More than. I've uh, known them for several years. <laughs> Nikolai I first met when he was still at the University of the West Indies, and he, um, he was part of a Trinidad um, team that was um, a part of a larger project that I was co-directing on gender, sexuality, sexual culture, and HIV, HIV and AIDS in the Caribbean, and that was a Caribbean-wide project. And Nikolai was part of that team, and I came to know him then. Um, and I, I believe that's also when some of this research really started um, to get going because his focus in that project was a lot on the queer community at the time. But we, you know, we were in touch since then. Um, he came to Toronto um, and I worked with him as well there. Preeti Kumar, I first met as an MA student, I believe, at York University. And, um, and we've been in conversation a lot as well. And so I'm really delighted to have these two people with me here today. It's just fantastic to see how their work has grown and has really pushed the boundaries of sexualities research in the Caribbean, really and truly. And I think um, um, we will get to hear some, about some of that work today. Um, and, um, you know, we have a copy of Nikolai's book, which um, for sale here as well. So I will just turn to introduce them and then ask them both to speak for uh, about 15 so minutes about their work. And then 
If there's time, I'll ask some questions. Otherwise, we can open it up for a uh, more general conversation. Okay. Um, Dr. Nikolai Atai, sorry, <laughs> is an assistant professor of ethnic studies at Colorado State University with a focus on black, queer, and feminist studies. He received his PhD in women and gender studies at the University of Toronto and an MPhil in cultural studies and a BA in media and communication from the University of the West Indies in Trinidad. He will be speaking today about his recently published book, Defiant Bodies, Making Queer Community in the Anglophone Caribbean, which is um, published by Rutgers University Press earlier this year, um, which explores queer politics in Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago. As he's going to be talking about his work, I'm not going to say anything more about it, <laughs> but we can certainly discuss afterwards. Um, um, and um, I mean, it's a fantastic looking cover of the book. And the content is equally as beautiful. <laughs> so we'll be hearing about that. Um, I'll say a bit more about Dr. Tai. He's been working on several projects that study how prevailing notions of legitimacy influence people's sense of belonging in the Caribbean and its diasporas. He is co-editor of a collection of essays entitled Free Up Yourself, Transgressive Bodies and Contestations in the Carnivalesque that is currently under peer review with the University of the West Indies Press. Uh, this new collection interrogates the multiple ways that people can test sexual and gendered expectations through their bodily performances across Caribbean and Caribbean diaspora carnival spaces. He has a number of other publications as well, um, including Let's Liberate the Bullers, a journal article, um, a, 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 an essay on, co-written co essay on LGBT rights, sexual citizenship, and black lighting um, in the Anglophone Caribbean and a co-authored chapter titled Tales from the Field, Myths and Methodologies for Researching Same-Sex Desiring People in the Caribbean. Um, and um, being, of course, such a prolific writer, he's also got several works in progress and publications coming out soon, so look out for those. Dr. Tai is also working on two queer archival projects and maybe he'll talk about this later as well. He's building a, a Cyrus Sylvester digital archive of queer Trinidad and Tobago to catalog some 5,000 images, videos, and other ephemera collected from the 1980s to the present. And that must be quite a project. Mm. Um, yeah, the other project from which he is a co-investigator with two University of Toronto faculty members is entitled Translocal Action Dialogues with Digital Archives, Exposure Sensitive Methods and Ethics for Queerly Minoritized Materials. That will convene a meeting of queer community archivists from Canada, the United States, Africa, and the Caribbean in Toronto. At Colorado State University, Dr. Tai manages the Collab Lab, a collaborative um, research project which investigates the ways in which race and gender and sexuality inform a sense of belonging um, in very context in the US and beyond. There he works closely with students by providing a space to nurture and inspire innovative and exciting research. Current projects include the Undergraduate Academy of Feminist Scholars, which provides training in transnational feminist research, and the Real Talk Academy, which recently provided an opportunity for black African, black and African American students to document and analyze their experiences at CSU. That's the um, Colorado State University. He's working on many other exciting research and social justice projects in Trinidad and Tobago, which again, we can ask him about later on. Um, I'll introduce um, Preeti Kumar immediately, and then they, they, they'll both have a chance to speak. Um, Dr. Kumar is an Indo-Guyanese queer scholar, activist, and educator whose work examines women's loving women, women's loving women relationships, violence, and LGBTQ rights in Guyana. She holds a PhD in gender, feminist, and women's studies from York University, Toronto. 
and her current research focuses on the coloniality of violence in the lives of queer women. Um, before arriving at the University of Rhode Island, where she is now uh, assistant professor, um, she taught at Hamilton College, the College of New Jersey, and York University. Her first monograph is entitled An Ordinary Landscape of Violence, Women Loving Women in Guyana, is forthcoming also from Rutgers University Press. And I think I've seen, I had a, a preview of the um, cover as well, it's equally as beautiful, and I think probably also, again, the content will match that. So each will say something about their books, and then we can have a conversation afterwards. So welcome, both of you, and um, look forward to hearing you, you speak. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, I, should I go up? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> for the camera. All yeah. oh, right, for the recording oh. and <laughs> live stream. Good, so thank you. Everyone, I'm really excited to be here on you know, what is turning out to be a really exciting book tour um, and to just have an opportunity to be in conversation with people I, I admire, people who mentor me uh, and just to hold space with, uh, you know, community. I think that's really uh, important in, in the work we're doing. So, you know, all protocols observed, I just want to thank everyone for uh, joining me in this space to celebrate uh, new and exciting research in Caribbean sexualities, mm -hmm. and also uh, to celebrate my book, Pretty's forthcoming book, uh, with Rutgers University Press. And I'd also like to spe say special thanks to my mentors, Kamala Kempudu, especially thank you for your mentorship over the years. I couldn't believe it was so long ago we met uh, for that project. Uh, so that would be, wow, that's years, years ago, at least maybe 2008 or nine, that project happened. Um, and then, you know, following my journey, supporting me through the PhD program in Toronto, uh, through my postdoc, and even through various iterations of what became this book eventually. Um, I'd also like to thank Clax and the Watson Institute for making this event possible for Caitlin and the, the crew over the LGBTQ Center for that really amazing lunch. It was so good to just have some good Chinese food and sit with students and engage in really invigorating conversation uh, on issues beyond uh, the book, you know, just as students uh, navigate our life <laughs> here at Brown in the U.S., uh, think about thinking about queerness and uh, so forth in the Caribbean and beyond. Uh, also, a special thanks to the team at Rutgers University Press for managing uh, the publication process, the book sales, and also the Brown uh, University Bookstore for making some copies available today. And you know, I encourage you to buy some copies, engage, and um, you know, if you want to engage further beyond today's event, feel free to hit me up. Uh, we could chat and have some more conversation. And I'd also like to thank my colleagues and the folks who are joining in online. Hi, everyone. Uh, my colleagues at CSU, students. I invited students from my both classes today: uh, Intro to Queer Studies and Ethnicity and Class and Ethnicity, Class and Gender in the U.S. Uh, some really amazing students. We. You know, we have really lively conversations, and I'm happy that they could join virtually here today. I have some folks from Trinidad and Tobago as well joining in. Uh, and then my colleagues from the Department of Ethnic Studies are also uh, joining us virtually to hold space. So I'm happy to have this uh, conversation. You know, I think the pandemic lockdown taught us to use technology uh, <laughs> to advantage. And this is one perfect example where we could hold space together across geographies. So I'm happy for that. So. Uh, Today, I really just wanted to focus a bit on how we could rethink queerness in the Caribbean uh, beyond tropes of uh, narratives of violence, uh, homophobia, transphobia, HIV, and AIDS, and beyond the Caribbean as a space of queer inability. And oftentimes, when asked about the, the Caribbean, the queer Caribbean, one of the first sentiments that arise is that the region is really the space of uh, again, excess homophobia, transphobia, state-sanctioned violence, disease, and death. And there's this idea that the Caribbean, that queer and trans people in the Caribbean live in a constant state of fear, of inability, and that they must oftentimes leave the region to thrive, to survive. And this is a reality, but at the same time, uh, I'm really interested in interrogating this, right? There's this idea that uh, persons must leave the Caribbean 
to find uh, what Sarah Ahmed theorizes as a good life, right, in her book, The Promise of Happiness. And inter interesting things have been happening in the world of uh, human rights activism, queer human rights activism, over the last few years, where we see international funding money uh, being used to mobilize particular narratives and a particular um, focus on queer liberation uh, for, for people in the global south. And in country, countries like those in the Caribbean that are positioned as the worst places to be queer. And the Caribbean as a space that continues to reconcile the long and lasting legacies of colonialism and European empire is a victim of this kind of liberatory politics. And uh, that emphasizes that all queer people are suffering, are dying, and so forth. And uh, the global north, we see, continues to thrive and mobilize these uh, white neoliberal uh, queer politics uh, and are positioning or being positioned as saviors, right, as queer saviors who go into these regions to uh, save the, the others. And we see how global north money is being allocated in ways that limit the kind of work that could be done to really think about queerness beyond these limiting tropes. And this really impacts the focus of the work that could be done. So in the first two chapters of the book, I spend a lot of time kind of mapping out how we see money from uh, organizations like UN AIDS, uh, from Canadian funders, other international funders really uh, limiting um, or influencing the kind of work that could be done oftentimes around decriminalization, around uh, HIV and AIDS, and so forth. Um, but in spending time with communities over the years, we see that you know, queer and trans communities on the ground you know, allow a different story to emerge, right? Uh, one that is more nuanced and really deeply complex, right? Uh, and these lived experience, experiences allow us to understand how queer and trans people actively negotiate uh, this violence, uh, which I know Preeti will be talking a lot about as well, uh, negotiate this violence to find and sustain community in really radical, transgressive, exciting, and creative ways. And in this book, and even in my larger work, you know, and in conversation with, you know, brilliant scholars of Caribbean sexualities, I know Kamala's work, uh, earlier work, has really been foundational for us, um, but other persons like Angelique Nixon, Rosamond King, Lyndon Gill, Crystal Gisewan, Preeti Kumar, Ryan Pasadi, Susan Pasad, and many others, so just to name a few, you know, uh, we're really in this moment where we, we're privileged to think together um, and really uh, mobilize exciting uh, theorizations and discourse about queer Caribbean uh, realities. And I'm really, in thinking with these people, I'm really interested in reframing how queerness is understood uh, in the Anglophone Caribbean and to really theorize the life-making experiences from a perspective of those on the ground, uh, in the trenches, and also those who roll up their sleeves to do the hard work of sustaining communities, the activists, the trans women who uh, do sex work, who live on the streets, who uh, are radical, who are defiant, who you know, go against all you know, the, the tenets of respectability that we've grown so accustomed to in, the, in our colonized regions. So in the book, Defiant Bodies, I wonder what it might mean for us to think of the queer experience beyond these kinds of limiting ideas mobilized in mainstream uh, uh, activist uh, North American Global North uh, frameworks. And what a discussion beyond these liberatory human rights frameworks could look like if we engage differently with the Caribbean. And also, what might it mean for us to center queer and trans people's silenced, but not silent, experiences to acknowledge and celebrate the defiant bodies that are part of heteropatriarchal, heterosexist, and heteronormative systems as they seek uh, autonomy and agency. And these are the kinds of questions you'll see me engage with throughout the book. Um, and I invite you to sit with the stories uh, as people rec recount uh, experiences of violence but, and fetishization, but also of uh, community making, of finding kinship, finding joy, having sex, right, uh, to understand how sites like Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago are uh, really interesting sites where we see activists, uh, you know, negotiating the international funding landscape uh, where there's very little support, right, uh, because queerness remains outlawed on state, religious, cultural, moral levels. Uh, 
and I, my, I think my favorite chapter is chapter three on uh, the cruising culture on gay sex in Barbados and abandoned hotels. So I invite you just to go into that space. Um, it's a really provocative, exciting space to see how uh, you know, queer people are uh, fulfilling their desires, right? You know, when we think about queerness, we, well, where discussions around queerness in the Caribbean oftentimes never account for sex and pleasure and joy, right? So I think chapter three is a really good mm -hmm. space where we could see uh, these tensions being played out, right? And I, I invite you to explore the world of drag pageantry um, and how uh, these spaces provide a, blue, a blueprint for us to think differently about uh, community and family. So uh, in preparing for today's talk, I found myself reflecting a lot on Sandy. Sandy is a Dogla Trinidadian, for those who aren't familiar with uh, the Dogla. The Dogla is someone, a biracial person, uh, mixed with Afro and Indo-Caribbean, uh, and uh, Caribbean uh, lineage, but also mixed, right? Uh, so it's uh, actually Suan Barrett and uh, uh, Aliyah Ranjit Singh has a really interesting book, uh, Dougla in the 21st Century, that really uh, problematizes and thinks about Dougla politics that moves beyond this kind of biracial, uh, this uh, multiracial uh, ethnic politics. So, so Sandy's this Dougla person, uh, this Dougla trans woman from a lower uh, uh, income suburban community in East Trinidad. And Sand, her experiences really anchor much of the discussion in the book and gives us a glimpse of the vibrant ways that she and many other trans women find uh, opportunities to thrive while actively negotiating the violence, discrimination, uh, and varying uh, forms of oppression. So I open the book with Sandy and you confront state-sanctioned vi state violence face-to-face -face, uh, on page one. Uh, not as a way to buy into the, the narratives of violence, but as an acknowledgement that indeed, uh, queer and trans people, especially uh, working class, low income, queer and trans people, uh, people's lives cannot be romanticized as we refocus a conversation on agency. And Sandy really helps us to understand the nuances and contours and provides glimpses of her defiant world making ex existence. So to avoid the, uh, oppression pornography, <laughs> I, I won't start uh, with the violence that Sandy faced. Instead, I just want to share some of her life with you uh, as a way to open up discussion and uh, after Preeti presents. So I will, I will actually just read a piece from the book on page 140. Uh, the section is titled, Trans Femininity, Respectability, and Accessibility. During my field work in Trinidad, I also interacted with many queer and trans people who socialize and work in urban, and suburban neighborhoods in the northeast of the island. In Trinidad, I accompanied Sandy and her friend Big Reds to numerous bars as they partied and did sex work in the small suburban town. I opened this book with discussions of Sandy's exclusion from activist interventions being done in the country because she was non-urban, working class, with little access to resources from local activist organizations. Firstly, she didn't know when, she didn't know they existed and after being attacked by the police officers one night in Arima, she failed to receive any support to seek recompense. Rum shop and bars feature as a safe space for Sandy as well, who is able to form community, find safety, and sometimes even make a living uh, in the typically hypermasculine space of the neighborhood rum shop. In such a space, it is in such a space that her agency, uh, her practices of agency are tangible as she negotiates her surroundings as a working class, gender transgressing person. The bar was, there was a bar across from the Savannah in Arima. It was, according to Sandy, the scene, the place to be on a weekend as it attracted a wide array of lower and middle class men from the town, many of whom were down low and engaged in secret relationships with queer people. Sandy explains, so I'm gonna read in Trinidadian uh, <laughs> lingo here, so uh, I hope you understand. Sandy explained, I just, go with, I just go with my drag clothes normal. I just walk by the junction, go by the bar, go by the next bar, by name omitted, and drink two beers and go my way. I tell, I tell you, nobody just be on me. I will take a taxi, walk through Arima, and go straight to where I just lying. I like to go down by Savannah Bar. They come like name omitted. 
two, you know, there's Nemo Method Part 2. And let's have hoes from tongue. Let's have hoes from tongue there all on a Friday and Saturday. Don't get tired, you know. You see, they, most of the people, they see moving normal, normal, they like that. So as I mentioned in the introductory chapter, Sandy lived close to and did domestic work around Arima. She, here she compares Savannah Bar to another bar in Port of Spain, which was not the most open and accepting space, being dominated by Afro-Trinidadian middle-class gay men with all others occupying peripheral spaces. The large numbers of men at Savannah Bar reminded her of this club. She presents herself in this space and others, not as a gay man, but a hyper-feminine hyper trans woman, which she feels makes her presence more palatable. Her dress, mannerisms, and interactions with people are legible as feminine enough, allowing her to successfully pass as a woman, resulting in the men she interacts with being more accepting of her. She found this to be true even when she visited the popular party strip in Port of Spain in the capital city. Even at home, she fulfills these gendered expectations and sees herself as a well-integrated member of her community. In an interview, I asked about her experience of being openly trans to her neighbors. So I asked, in terms of living around here, how is it? Sandy tells me, it good, cool. It have fellas around here. Everybody from the littlest child, all my neighbors know. I could go on the block and smoke. I just go on the block with them boys and burn a weed. All them, any block. They know about me and it's our norms. I gain respect in the neighborhood. So I then ask, what, what did you have to do to gain respect? And she tells me, I think it's just being cool and being disrespectful and being this kind of loud up, loud up, and, and in everybody's face kind of thing, you know? You know what you know what it is, you know what you're for. You're disrespecting nobody. If somebody come to you, you will, but you're disrespecting nobody. You know how much children is big man? I grow them up from baby, plenty of them. So I ask, so you see about children too? You, care for children too. So then she says, here, here or by the house. Plenty of them is big man now and nothing never happened. Then it, uh, nothing never happened then and it uh, happened now. It have people will tell you, Sandy, I trust in Sandy with all them children any day. I believe it's the way you carry about yourself. It's the way how you uh, carry about yourself. Cause I will tell you something. You see them gays down in town? I don't know. But they don't really like me because the reason they don't like me to tell you the truth because of how I just move. Like how them go like fight and thing, I'm not on that. I'm not that type of person, you understand? I just be more cool. I don't go nowhere to look for fight. If I see something, I go on from there. If somebody says something about me, I pretend I know what they say. <laughs> so Sandy's reflection above shows that she's, uh, she has accepted these gendered assumptions of, of her trans femininity, but also reveals how she navigates the space by adopting similar modes of respectability held by the wider society. She ensures that she, to quote, disrespect to nobody, and thinks that the way you carry about yourself is an important trait that members of her community and wider queer community should emulate. But adopting these feminized rules also has consequences for her more intimate interactions with the men around her. Sandy also reminisced about a recent relationship that she had with a young man in her neighborhood stating that on the surface, many men appear to be homophobic and transphobic when in fact they aim to get her attention. I will tell you something, eh? It have some of them men, because this happened to me plenty times. Some of them men will be getting on when they see a gay. Oh, I go beat you, I want to kill you. You see these men, it's them you have to watch. These are the men who just do, them, do things with gays. They just be using it as a cover up, but when you see them alone, it's a cool scene. It happened to me plenty times. It had a fella who lived right down, the, right down on the corner. A young fella. This boy always harassing me. The boy want to, I end up putting him in court, all kind of thing, because the boy harassing me all in the road. He was the only person harassing me and want to pelt me down. You know in the ending up, I just had to laugh. You know what is the outcome of that? <laughs> he ended up by me. <laughs> Well, here what go on. The mother, the mother begged me to drop the case and say he wouldn't do it again. Afterwards, now in the back there, so she points to her backyard, was open to come home from the block. He come, oh Sandy, where's the scene? I say, I cool. He say, we're going, I'm going to use the latrine there. So the latrine is the outhouse. 
I said, go ahead and free up now. Right here, I sit down on the step leading to the house. Next thing I hear, hey, Sandy, come now. I was like, what? He said, come now, one boy. I said, what the fuck? I know me and the man are good. Well, I, I get up and go and see. He was like, come and see what I have now. I say, I say so wait, where's the scene? You always harassing me. He say, let me forget that now. After, and since after, I remain dealing that boy right through. <laughs> Just the other day I talking about, and Sandy laughs hysterically. So while Sandy feels safe in these spaces, what does it mean for her as a working class trans woman to be accepted under hyper-masculine circumstances that gender and fetishize her body? I think about her location in these public and domestic spheres in relation to Crystal Gisiaman's succinct theorization that in Indo-Caribbean families, Queerness and gender categories are constructed in relation to a heterosexual man, where female sexuality is seen as a male thing, which links female pleasure and the making of a woman to penile penetration. This is clear in Sandy's interactions. Here, and with the police in the introductory chapter where her legibility depends on performing stereotypical hyperfeminity uh, to the amusement of men. Uh, at, uh, the police use their baton to physically and sim symbolically penetrate her, her body by forcing her to suck it. And at home, she's domesticated, even fulfilling men's domination by satisfying their sexual desires to penetrate her fetishized body and, perform, and by performing feminized tasks like childcare. Sandy and other stories are more colorful and exciting, and I really encourage you to sit with them uh, in sight of defiance in Barbados in the abandoned hotels in Guyana, in the rum shops and bars, in Jamaica, in Trinidad, in Trinidad and Tobago, to really experience the truly transgressive vibrance of these lives. And in closing, I, I, I want to end here by honoring those who have left us for another journey on another plane. And it may seem a bit ironic that I choose to end like this, uh, as I really try to reframe and re refocus uh, a discussion on queer agency. But uh, the fact is that queer and trans people are still dying. We are all dying. Actually, just yesterday, a trans woman was killed in Trinidad. She was found with uh, multiple stab wounds, wounds in, at the side of, a, of, a, of the street in the mountains. Right? And four people that I mentioned in this book have actually died. They have left us and left a deep void. Right? But as these lesbian and trans masculine communities teach us in chapter four, uh, we must honor our dead. Right, and so some questions I want us to ponder on as we think about really how complex are uh, talking about uh, queerness in the Caribbean, about uh, queer life. You know, how do we honor our queer uh, and trans ancestors in a way that does not capitalize on their mortality? How do we celebrate their legacies without being trapped by the logics of these liberatory free frameworks that we're so accustomed to in the global north? And how do we honor queer and trans people in ways that ensure their enduring presence? So I thank you, I'll end here, and I open the way for Preeti, who will be speaking a lot about uh, colonial violence and, uh, again, how people navigate and negotiate this. So, and I look forward to some conversation in afterwards. Hello. Um... So I'll be talking about oppression pornography. Um, <laughs> I would like to start by saying thank you all for being here today and giving me the opportunity to share my work. Um, particular thanks to Kamala for organizing this event and Caitlin and her crew as well for making all of this possible. Um, I want to start by congratulating Nikolai. Can we just give him one roll round of applause? Yeah. What a great book. I finished reading it right before I got here. I, I did well. Um, it was, I mean, the pictures, the analysis, so well theorized, well written, really insightful, and I'm looking forward to talking to you more about it um, as we have the conversation today. So um, my book is entitled, um, today I'll be providing a brief uh, re overview um, of my research interests um, in Guyana and discuss the th key themes of my forthcoming book, uh, An Ordinary Landscape of Violence, Women Loving Women in Guyana, which is forthcoming uh, with Rutgers Press. Um, actually, I just got an email like a, a couple days ago saying it's coming out July 12, 2014. <laughs> so that was good to know. <laughs> 
Um, this is a, a picture I took of my apartment in Georgetown, Guyana, and I will tell you the significance of this apartment as well after the talk if anybody's interested. But let me get started. And I do want to say that I do want to give a trigger warning that I will be discussing um, uh, you know, a lot of violence in the talk today. And um, if you need to take care of yourself, please step out, have a drink of water, and do, uh, do whatever you need to do to take care, because I am talking about heavy, heavy material. I would like to give some context that when I started this project in 2016, I didn't set out to talk about violence. That was in my research project. I set out to talk about um, community making and how uh, women identify in Guyana, particularly queer women, LGBTQ women, um, how did they make a life for themselves in Guyana. And it's so funny that I think your book takes up that narrative of community making and um, talks about sites of resistance and spaces of resistance. And mine took a different trajectory where uh, I couldn't not talk about violence. I didn't have a choice not to talk about the violence. So this book really shifted over the years um, and kind of uh, what happened in my research, also happy to talk about that. So in the heart of Georgetown, my small apartment held many secrets within its old and worn, time-worn walls. Attached to a Dutch colonial style home, my apartment on the third floor with its aged and worn out furniture hosted several conversations and heard many stories and secrets. In this tiny apartment, Roxanne, a mixed race woman in her 20s, dressed in khaki pants and a striped polo shirt with Converse sneakers, ate cereal in my apartment. In this intimate uh, conversation with her, she shared a deeply troubling experience of her father, a religious man, expressing violent sentiment towards her due to her sexual orientation. This narrative exemplifies the painful experiences that women loving women in Guyana face. And I'm also happy to talk why I use that language, particularly at the end of the talk. Quote, he always said straight up, if I had gay kids, I would kill them. When he found out I was gay a few years later, he took me church. He took me to a church and prayed for me and put oil on my head. He threatened me like, if you don't change this, I'm gonna kick you out of the house. I'm gonna kill you. The Bible says you should stone your child to death, but I ain't gonna stone you, I gonna shoot you. He keep telling me this straight up and that really messed up our relationship, end quote. My book, An Ordinary Landscape of Violence, examines the experiences of violence faced by women loving women in Guyana. In 2016, I, I interviewed 33 women um, across the capital city in Georgetown and in rural Burbies um, in Guyana, which are like two sets of different experiences that came out. And the women were uh, of Indo-Guyanese background, Afro-Guyanese and mixed race, and they were from the ages of 18 to 64, 65 years old. This experience, or this excerpt that I present to you today, along with many others, highlight the intersecting and multiple levels of violence that structure the lives of women loving women in Guyana. And although Guyana is located in South America, it has retained its economic, political, and social links to English-speaking Caribbean, and it's the only English-speaking country in South America. The country's inheritance um, of colonial structures of heterosexuality and patriarchy is premised on violence as a mechanism in its regulation and governance of a citizen. While violence is often viewed as a problem or a, a specific heterosexual problem, uh, it, it, it is an essentializing narratives that cast women as passive recipients of violence in the media. So for example, um, when you look at me how the media talks about domestic or gender-based violence, it's always women are the victims of their jealous husband and their passive uh, recipients. But all, not only that, they are um, deserving of the violence because the, fr the newspaper often frames them as women who are cheating on their partners. So therefore, the violence is justified. What happens in this, in this conversation is simply put, um, violence is seen as unilateral. It is something that happens to women. Queer bodies remain absent from the public discourses or are portrayed negatively when they do enter into social media. When reporting um, a violence against queer people, it is portrayed as a consequence of their own inherent criminality. So for example, jilted man butchers gay sex worker, kills self, male sex worker shot dead by angry client. So the media frames them as robbers and thieves um, who, whose, whose debt is, deser who deserves that kind of debt and punishment? Um, 
male sex worker robs client of uh, cash, wristwatch, and court hears, right? So this, we see this violence that not only pathologizes their body and, and creates marks of criminality, but it completely ignores the role of the perpetrator in this kind of violence on queer bodies as well. So rather than echoing the state's rhetoric, let me just move this over, I apologize. Rather than echoing the state's rhetoric that frames gender-based violence primarily as a heterosexual issue, my work seeks to expand this conversation. And you know, while you know, Nikolai's work talks about the community making in spite of the violence, I'm seeking to expand and, and say, well, how can we understand um, the violence within the lives of queer people? Because I do think there's a purpose of violence in their life, which I will get to. It is essential to consider the unique challenges faced by the queer community and broaden the understanding of violence beyond traditional perspectives. I examined ways in which queer domestic violence functions in both rural spaces and, urban, and the urban city of Guyana. So, um, I introduce my research, you know, I draw from Caribbean feminist scholars, I draw from queer theory, but particularly I, I, mean, I draw from affect theory um, in my research, and I argue that violence is not merely an ins isolated incident, but a dynamic and pervasive affectual force that continues to impact women loving women long after the, in, um, the event has occurred. So violence, as I'm trying to show in this book, transcends our markers of identity and leaves a lasting impression. And here I'm drawing from Brian Masumi, who's a, an, a, an affect th theorist that I, I use a lot to frame my work. He notes, and I quote, the concept of violence cannot be reduced to direct bodily violence. Violence is not only in the act, it, also, it is also acts in potential. And I like that idea of thinking about violence as already present, as an, as an already potentiality that we're embedded in. What does it mean to conceive of violence as potentiality, omnipresent, pervasive, relational, and dynamic? Instead of an incident, or instead of thinking of violence as an incident, a moment, and an, a simply an enc encounter. I argue that violence as a type of um, affect circulates and permeates between individuals, the state, and the landscape of Guyana. And, and one of the key way I, I look at violence is that not only do I take up the violence between the state and women loving women and within their own relationships, but I talk about the landscape itself. What energies do landscapes contain? What stories do we hear about violence in Guyana? And how does that shape our psyche as Guyanese people? So I provide, um, in the book, I provide a comprehensive portrayal of how violence transcend the social categories of race, class, gender, and geography. And while you know, my work is in form about, my work is intersectional, at the same time, I am arguing that violence leaves a trace. It's as a mark, a lingering sensation that remains with us in the aftermath of the event. So I want to talk about the aftermath. The book contends that violence as a form of affect emphasizes the emotions and felt experience within the lives of women loving women, and it delves into their experience. And here, it, this is kind of what I am, I am looking at, is not only just the structures, but what are the feltness of violence? What does violence feel like? How does it remain with us and stay with us? So, um, <laughs> To, to put briefly, I, I have an outline of the book that I'm gonna share with you um, that you know, I hope to summarize some of the key ideas of the book. Um, violence, therefore, uh, encompasses not only the physical and psychological aspects of these women's lives, but becomes deeply ingrained in the very space where the potential for violence already exists. In essence, in essence, the potential for violence already shapes their lives, altering how women loving women navigate and interact with their surroundings. The potentiality of violence constitutes what, what um, another scholar has called an ecology of fear that is part of the social fabric of Guyana, especially for queer women. The potentiality of this violence blurs the binary framing that we often have of violence as perpetrator, survivor, witness, bystander, state, or citizen. So, in chapter one, oops, I need that page, sorry. <laughs> In chapter one, affective economies of the state, what I show is that I examine how affective emotions of fear, distrust, and suspicion collectively form and perpetuate an environment of violence. 
in this chapter, um, I go back to Guyana's colonial history and I look at how the political party, Indo, uh, the PPP, Indo dominated and the PNC, particularly Afro dominated, how they harness um, affective feelings of fear and distrust between the ethnic groups to garner votes and political support. And this fear and distrust, as I show, spills into the lives of women. They come to embody this fear and distrust. So, for example, in chapter one, I present a narrative of Anna during a crime spree who was raped, and the, but the crime spree is set during an election time, and how that violence, now she becomes, our, bears the brunt of that violence based on how the government, um, theor, like not theorizes, how the government um, portrays the other in Guyana. Uh, I also talk about another woman, Janice, um, uh, in that chapter who attempted to go to court to talk about rape, but uh, couldn't get anything done for her case, for example, because the perpetrator was a relative of somebody in the government at that time. So I look at the colonial structure in the first chapter. And the second chapter, Affective Economies of Religion, I ask a simple question. What does the experience of religion feel like for women? How do religious narratives become accessible, circulated, and integrated into their lives? And the opening quote that I showed you with Roxanne, who talked about the father, illustrates the deep-seated issues where religious uh, discourses, oops, sorry, where religious discourses keep generating feelings of shame, distrust, and self-hatred for queer bodies. So a lot of the women, um, one of the things that came out in, in, the, in the research was all of the women pointed, and of course there was Christians, Hindus, Muslims, um, and indigenous, two indigenous women in my study, and all of them pointed to religion in some form or, or way to talk about how they have disassociated themselves from the community. Um, and here Lisa is talking about um, how you know, she knew from the Bible how homosexuality is a sinful and dirty thing. She went to church a few times and then stopped going because whenever the topic of homosexuality came about, the, the Bible, it becomes um, dirty and sinful. And I, I show this you know, because while the women det detach themselves from religion, they also carve out their own understanding of spirituality and talk about, you know, I believe in God or I claim God in a different kind of queer way for myself. So I don't only, I don't just want to paint that they're suppressed or oppressed by all forces in Guyana. Um, chapter three, in, which was the most, I think chapter three and chapter four were the two most interesting chapters for me in my work. And I here I turned to Burbies to examine the rural countryside. How queerness is shaped by respectability politics in predominantly an Indo-Guyanese community. And here I look at how um, for middle class women, for example, uh, Mina, she talked about, you know, her father's a respectable man. I cannot carry myself like that. Uh, you know, it's how you carry yourself, which is also came out in your book, the idea of respectability and the profound regulation it has on queer bodies in, in Guyana as well. So this external perception actually leads her to um, not, not live a queer self in Burbies. I mean, kind of does, but kind of doesn't. Um, you know, and because of her class status, she's also able to travel abroad and experience queer lives in different kinds of ways. Um, uh, the last two chapters, chapter four and five, um, intimate partner violence and uh, suicide, um, were really surprising for me. And like I said, I didn't set out to talk about violence, but almost every single woman I interviewed in Guyana had a story of violence. And in this chapter, I look at, and I quote, she had jealousy issues, temper problem, um, like I hit her and it escalated every time we fight. It's okay except for the part about jealousy. So in this chapter, I turn to what is the, what is the function of jealousy in the lives of women? Just like how st the straight women or heterosexual women are being blamed for the violence that happens to them by their male partners, we see this affective feeling of jealousy showing up in queer relations as well. So effectively, I look at how does jealousy function in their life? How does it get played out in what kinds of spaces and how does it show up? And the next quote, as you can see, is from Sydney, also an Indo-Guyanese woman. And here, um, she's telling me about her partner, who's a Rasta woman, um, who was very aggressive, and she kept telling her, no, I want to stop. I don't know. She said, it's probably because I wanted it, because um, I gave in. And I was like, oh, maybe I did want it. I gave in, because I don't know. Um, I don't know how you would consider that laughs. And the fact that she laughs tells you something very interesting about how one has to cope with violence. That's probably a no, because maybe I did want it, and I was just like being, you know, holding out. 
So I take up um, issues of consent. I take up issues of, of how violence, um, how do women also use violence in their lives against other women and how they make sense and rationalize that violence um, as, a, as a site of power. It is violence as a site of power for them um, in, in a lot of ways. So we, we must contend with what kinds of narratives are promoted and articulated by individuals, the media, and the government in the name of love. And like I said, these stories never make the media because one, women are not out in public or come forward to the, to the cops. Chapter five, um, I, I'm gonna wrap up soon. <laughs> uh, st what I, ca I call this chapter still, still life because here I turn to their psychic war. And I look at the women who have resorted to self-harm, whether um, non-suicidal self-harm and acts of suicide as coping mechanisms. And I examine their psychological disposition here at the intersections of gender and race. Um, and chapter, you can see on this quote, Roxanne, the, the, the one who I opened the quote with, you know, this is what she tried to do later in her life. Quote, I used to cut myself. I got scars all over my arms when I used to cut myself. Tried killing myself, tried popping pills, and I also used to drink, and she drank heavily. Everything seemed so black, just black and dull and depressing. You could say emotionally disturbed. My first official girlfriend was also 19. She was a whore and she died of AIDS, laughed. That messed me up too. Notice the laugh again, all right? Diana, um, a mixed race, actually indigenous, she's uh, identified from a particular indigenous group in Guyana, and she tells, I would hit the wall, and then I would sometimes take sharp object, but not like the cut and bleed, just to feel the pain, just to feel, but nothing, um, nothing like I was going to kill myself. It's just that you have so much anger in you, you can't hurt anybody, and a bit of relief causes, it, it causes a bit of relief for me. So here I talk about um, what is like, if we are to talk about suicide and violence in Guyana, how do we make sense of these experiences where people are, are actively using these things as coping mechanisms and strategies as well? How do we hold both of those parts in conversation with each other? So, <laughs> that was a lot, very heavy. Maybe we all could take a deep breath. <sighs> Within discourses of states and or stall, um, state and doors, sorry, let me try again. Within discourses of state um, campaigns for tolerance and acceptance of queer um, individuals, it is imperative to acknowledge the persistence of affective violence in the lives of women perpetrated by the state and other structural inequalities. Homophobia, stigmatization by religious bodies, and the sexualization of lesbian relationships effectively silence them, preventing them from openly addressing their experience of violence, both in the public and within official platforms. Efforts by the queer community show how LGBTQ individuals are subject to violence, yet discussions surrounding violence within our own relationships are marginalized due to fear of further ex exacerbating stigma and delegitimization by the state. Violence is indeed complex and potent affect rooted in both state structures and intense emotions, and it is intricately embedded within the ordinary landscape of Guyana. Thank you. <laughs> Can I speak from here? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. Um, I'm coming. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. That um, you know, they're both very different pieces of work that you're dealing with, but yet there's a lot of um, things that resonate across um, mm -hmm. your studies. Um, I had some questions that you know, various questions that I prepared, but I think given the time. I'm going to ask if anybody has any burning questions that we can open it up with uh, a conversation here. Um, if not, I will also start us off. Yes, go ahead, Tarika. Good to see you. Hi. Yeah.
Mm-hmm. Um, so I just try to keep myself healthy and keep my body healthy and keep my mind healthy and keep my body safe and healthy and um, I feel good spiritually. And also, um, so bile salts and things that you work with and that's what you do with your clients. Yeah, um, thank you for that. In the chapter, actually, um, where I take up uh, affect uh, intimate partner violence, I do trace it back to the colonial structure. And I do use those examples during indenture period where you see this narrative really emerging, but also becoming cemented in written in colonial records, right? They gain power, they gain prominence. And I, I trace I trace that narratives on how, and how precisely this is what I'm talking about, how af jealousy is an affect, right? It's a type of affect. It, it does not tie itself to heterosexual structure. So in Guyana, if we want to talk about violence, I feel like we also have to take into consideration how these affective um, embodiments are with us or continue to stay with us. We can address the structures all we want, but unless we address how we embody these structures, I think violence remains present or can shape and alter itself. And I was also very surprised by you know, how it kept showing up. Um, you know, in, in the chapter, there's a woman in rural Burbese, uh, her partner works at the rum shop. Mm. And, you know, this rum shop is a great space for, you know, you go and party and drink two beer and you have your queer community. But even within that space, her partner is mixed race and she's indo Guyanese. She doesn't trust her partner. She feels like her partner is going to cheat on her. Mm. So, you know, she sits at the bar every night and she waits for her so they could walk home together. Mm. And she's like, well, you know, I'm not jealous. I just, you know, you know she, I, I, just, I just don't know she's going to go sleep with man, you know? So even within these spaces of liberation and community making, for the women I interview, there's a real anxiety when, they, when they're in these space, right? And at the time of my research, all the women were also cisgender queer women. None of them identify as trans at that time. So in my work, I try to show that even when embodying the space, there's an affective fear, a suspicion. And that plays out differently depending if, you know, which space they're in. And, you know, like with the, with the woman and mixed race, she was like, no, um, she gonna cheat on me. She gonna send me home and sleep with man. So I gotta, I gotta police her, mm -hmm. right? So I was also, you know, to summarize, I was very surprised at how jealousy showed up in their relationship and how it's a site of similar justification for the violence. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, part of Guyana, that's what you're told is love. Jealousy is love. Mm -hmm. Oh, you knock you too slop, it's love. So if I, if I knock her too, and they laugh a lot, a lot of participants, when they narrate their violence, there is a way in which they're making sense of it too for me. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. If I could just, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, also, yeah, I like how you, you talk about the rum shop space as this space of where <laughs> jealousy mm -hmm. as an affect circulates. And I actually have, like, not even thinking about it then, but in thinking about the rum shop space with Sandy and Big Red, uh, in chap towards the end of chapter, uh, on, on page one, 145, so close to where I read, yeah, we see how, um, like, the, how this jealousy is negotiated. So there's an incident where Sandy and Big Red fell out in the, in the rum shop because uh, Sa they, they were, what, what, what they say locally, picking pairs. Mm -hmm. And Big Red was getting all the attention, and Sandy, oh, it's, it's probably off, and Sandy, uh, Sandy was, uh, was jealous, and they started to fight, and Big Red left and whatnot. But at the same time, we see an in interesting interaction with, a woman who says she doesn't have a problem with the gay men, but when they start to put on our clothes and look better than us and that take all the attention, that is where I have a problem. So we see now how even this jealousy is deeply gendered mm -hmm. as well. Where um, And in the field, I found that a lot of times the women had, uh, and in these rump shops, the women were the ones who had a bigger issue with the trans women because mm -hmm. they, they were stealing the limelight. Um, mm -hmm. And again, like this, this, this glimpse I gave you of the space that Sandy went in, then she says, you know, the men want it, right? Um, so I guess the women are also keenly aware of their, uh, cisgender women are mm -hmm. keenly aware of their relationship to everyone in the bar, to the trans women, to the men mm -hmm. uh, who are attracted to everybody. Yeah. So, and so we see how the jealousy yeah. circulates and um, in that, that space like this. And because of that, you know, the gender difference, racial difference in these spaces, what you end up, what I end up fun finding in my research was that 
you know, the women in, in my study did all, all kinds of like social justice work, you know, whether working for HIV campaigns or domestic shelters and stuff like that, but none of them were at the forefront of LGBT rights in Guyana. None of them would take up space in that way because there was also a deep fear and distrust of gay men and trans women. So there's a lot of tension and conflict even within the community. Who's at the forefront of these movement? Who's using the monies from America? Um, who's spearheading? And a lot of them was like, no, I'm not gonna go to that space. I don't want to be a part. And in fact, they asked me, am I a part of that space? Because okay. they didn't want to talk to me uh, if I was. Mm -hmm. So there was some tension there. We could <laughs> talk yeah. more about. There's a question over oh. here. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Right there. Um, Well, I only had one place. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna get to it. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to go first, or should I go? Uh, yeah. So, mine. How did I balance writing? I don't know if I did. I don't think I did. Um, I think I wanted to just a lot of the scholarship in Guyana. In Guyana, I would say the Caribbean comes from a lot of capital cities, urban spaces. I'm from Burbies, so it was very important for me to go back to the Burbies and did interviews. And I interviewed nine women there. And I really had to make sense of rurality and queerness. And in the chapter, Queer in Burbies, I talk about family and the family structure and how, how older women, and it became very complicated because you have older women, like, and I quote older, like 30 plus, who have kids, and they're totally integrated into their community way differently than young women. Mm -hmm. So what does queerness look like is really, contextual based on age, but also motherhood. Who's fulfilled their motherhood obligations to the society and family? Um, so I'm not sure if I balanced it, but I try to theorize how belonging unfolds and what does it look like in these spaces, right? Um, I guess yeah. that's what so I So I mean, say. I think um, in doing this kind of work, the writing needs to be messy. Yeah. Um, it, I think it needs to be uh, like, we, we, I, I also don't have an answer for like balancing the writing, but I, the Caribbean as a site, pro, you know, provides a really useful space for us to think across geographies, right? We're true colonization, uh, we're taught to think uh, in silos, think against each other. So I think that the Palestine-Israel conflict right now, the, what was happening now is a perfect example of how messed up colonization makes us, right? But um, so me doing research and writing on four spaces, five if I include Toronto, um, really allowed me this opportunity to, to be messy. I had, to, I, at any one time, I had to think about a site in relation to the other sites. Mm -hmm. I couldn't think about uh, the hotel in Barbados without thinking about uh, the situation that trans women were facing in Guyana around the, uh, the cross-dressing laws, right? And at that time of the research, at the time of the writing was when these laws were in court and or the, the cases that were happening in Trinidad and Jamaica and so forth, right? So we have to think, of, like I had to think about what was happening across the sites in relation to each other. I think that that's the, the amazing thing about doing this kind of work, um, the messiness of doing the work, but the importance of thinking about and understanding um, the, like how our colonial histories yeah. continue to impact us, right? How this violence and how these, uh, uh, dynamics travel. So actually, that was a, a conversation I had with one of the students uh, earlier today, right? Like, how do we think about the experiences across the spaces? So if you're doing multi-sided uh, work, or even if you're, you think you're just dealing with one site, it's really important to think as broadly as possible, but also make things messy, put things in conversation with each other, uh, mm -hmm. even when you, you, it's not apparently uh, yeah. easily uh, or readily available to, for you to do that. So yeah. And just be messy. Yeah, <laughs> have fun with the messiness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for asking us to go. So actually, I think when she asked about the previous women uh, in this book, it reminds me of my experience at the first public reception in Italy. Because when we talk about coming to the LGBT Caribbean event or the LGBT Trinidad, I think in Port of Spain, mm -hmm. we're thinking about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Yeah. So what does that look like in, in, in amongst the world? Yeah. And very similar to the 
Can I can I piggyback on that oh, yeah. question? It's more question more to do with that idea that I think so both of you worked with a little bit as well. Um, the, well, the, apart from the messiness that, that we're you know kind of dealing with, it's also um, the the not claiming of an identity, right? Mm -hmm. The sexual praxis, right? Yeah. Which I've thrown up at some point, <laughs> um, and um, as being a way to think about. Um, queerness in the region or sexualities um, as not tied or fixed to these identities. And I'm wondering if that's also something that travels into mm -hmm. outside of the cities as well. Yeah. I mean, but, or is it, is it important anymore? I mean, it, it, it has identity become a really important part yeah. Yeah. in these uh, sexual minority communities? Yeah. So before I lose my train of thought, I think I would say it's not it shouldn't be important, like this identity mm -hmm. politics, but we're seeing an interesting thing now with the younger folks who are organizing, students who have gone to university in the US and Canada and the UK coming back and wanting particular representations of their queer identities. Mm -hmm. And is but, that more in the city? And yeah, so that's yeah. definitely an urban kind of uh, yeah. politics. Yeah. But uh, Sandy is actually one who made me rethink my project as well, because going to Trinidad, going to these spaces, my first entry point was with the activists. How are you, what kind of funding are you getting? How are you, how are you negotiating this funding, right? And then when I went to interview Sandy, it was actually my uncle who put me on the Sandy in this suburban uh, neighborhood. And Sandy was like, I don't know none of them groups you're talking about. If, yeah. if they come to me, I can give them a story. I can write a book for them, right? Um, and because and, and, and I, I started to ask Sandy when she recounted the experience of the violence. I was like, so what about Kaiso? What about uh, the Women's Caucus? What about, uh, or I, I was able to list like seven groups. She's like, I don't know any of these groups. Mm -hmm. And right, um, so I think, and these non-urban, uh, lower-income communities are the spaces where we really see the work that these activist groups want to do. We see the work happening in really interesting ways that moves beyond formalized activism um, and stuff, So and move, moves beyond this identity politics. And I think, too, the funding landscape, at least in what I saw in my work, the funding landscape encourages this kind of identity-based uh, activism, right, where you have to identify as something. And that's actually some work I'm thinking about. I know David Murray from Canada did some recent work, some really important work on, in his book, Real Queer, mm -hmm. thinking about how uh, refugees who enter, who go to spaces like Canada, have to assume an identity to be legible in the legal system, right? And that's something we spoke about as well at right? You have to be, you have to identify as, as trans or gay or uh, lesbian. Uh, but when you come from spaces where these words mean nothing to you, right? Um, they, they don't resonate the same way. You now have to learn, in that, and that's the case in a lot of these immigration uh, dynamics, right? So and David Murray explores that, and I started to think about that uh, when I w was interacting with persons who sought asylum in places like Amsterdam and Toronto, um, and, and what it means to them now to have to learn this identity-based uh, politics to be legible and to gain the safety that they're seeking. So yes, yeah, so I, I would say it's, I would, I would not want to center that identity-based politics because I understand what it means uh, to think about the experiences that are grounded socially, politically, culturally, but at the same time, the funding money encourages it and the younger generations of persons who are in, uh, in the urban areas want mm -hmm. this, right? So we have, we're seeing more pride celebrations happening now that with the pride flags, the parade, uh, the PDAs, the public displays of affection and stuff like that when that's not necessarily what it has been. Yeah. Uh, historically. Yeah. Preeti, I don't know if you wanted to. Um, yeah, I was just going to add, I, I agree with you um, that we see it's a generational thing happening between a different group of women in Guyana who say, you know, I like women. A lot of them have also been married to men and have children, right? Um, so they don't actively identify as a lesbian. There's a younger generation that, who, that does identify also because of media. They're traveling abroad. Visas accessible in Guyana. They all have, you know, family in New York and Florida. They come by, and while they claim an identity, I would, and that's important, I think, for a, a different, younger generation of women in my study. It's not a political identity, because at the same time, while they claim that identity, they say, "Well, I got to be out there in the streets protesting. Why? Why I got to protest any, anything, right?" Mm -hmm. So when we talk about identity politics and funding, 
identity is it's very complicated, um, it's very nuanced, but it, it's not always political. It could just be a self-subjective understanding of yourself and the world, right? Um, in Barbies, uh, I had a participant said to me, I was like, you know, I was talking to her about human rights. She's like, human rights? She's like, yeah, I see all these people talking about human rights, but I don't know what that means, right? So things don't translate well either. Like, it's not in Creole, yeah. <laughs> right? She's like, how are you going to come here and tell me I need human rights now? I know I'm a human being. You know, like, just this, just this like, real, like, what, what do you, what, how are you, yeah. what, do you, what do you mean I need human rights? Like, for sexuality? What, what, like, what do you mean? I already have my child, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and she has a, a partner and li lives in her house next to her parents and takes, ki takes care of her parents. So what is this new conversation with yeah. rights that I need, right? Yeah. So thinking through how transla transibility, translatability, mm -hmm. um, how that filters or doesn't, or yeah. maybe just doesn't need to filter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, so the last question we can take, I think, and then we, have, we can carry on the conversations <laughs> yes. outside. Uh, <laughs> I think that that's a really important observation um, because again we're and again that I feel like if the themes have been this is this is all we've been discussing all day uh, with the over at the center at one one student asked about just a, a similar question about thinking about the, the kinds of linguistic barriers that exist in the Caribbean and how that uh, prevents or what what in, what kinds of unlikely um, Connections. Connections, yeah, my brain <laughs> blank there. Yeah, it's probably coming down from the altitude. Uh, uh, encourages so, um, so, and we, we had a, an interesting conversation around the ways that our work again. I think we all come in like a space like Brazil as well, right? We all, we're all still contending with these very similar colonial legacies, mm -hmm. right? So we find ways to, oh, the, the the things we're theorizing, the issues we're thinking about. Uh, uh, really, we could relate to them across these linguistic mm -hmm. and geographic spaces. And even in my work, I found that I had to turn a lot to work from the uh, the Latinx Caribbean. From I actually uh, Tanya Saunders' piece uh, on uh, yeah. Las Crudas, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, rap feminism, was a really important piece to me. Um, another piece on uh, Vanessa Ega Jones's work on uh, Martinique, right? So we, we see that we're we're, we're in conversation. Yeah. Um, through a writing, like that's the archive that I had to, and I'm sure pretty as well, thinking about how we had to be at engage with, mm -hmm. to uh, really think about what's happening, right? Um, I think that that's that's the, the messiness and the excite the exciting thing about doing this kind of work, right? Where we have opportunities to think with other persons across these spaces, mm -hmm. um, and find again these unlikely uh, connections uh, across linguistic, geographic uh, mm -hmm. barriers, and so forth. Yeah, I think we're at a really beautiful moment right now where there's so many of us coming together, networking, building connections, alliances across these differences or in spite of these differences. And, um, you, you know, I think one thing I'm thinking about is thinking about the Indo-Caribbean community in like Suriname, Martinique, right? Um, other spaces that are non-English, right? And also in the diaspora. I want to exp expand my work now into the diaspora of New York and Toronto and Florida, I don't know. Um, but it's we're really at a prime moment to think to think about this work. And perhaps this is something you can also take up yeah. in your own work. Yeah. Yeah? And I like you said, because I've like i been recently, since the book, you know, I've been engaging with a lot of people, uh, people who are interested in starting their PhDs. Just this week I was having a conversation with a guy from a uh, dancer from St. Lucia, so he's, he wants to start his PhD. So he's talking about uh, masculinity in St. Lucia, but he doesn't want to do that because, again, we're so colonized that like, we don't feel as if we could write about ourselves. Yeah. And I, I encourage people to write. We, we need scholarship on St. Lucia. We need, I have another uh, colleague who's doing stuff on St. Vincent, right? Uh, and queer politics in St. Vincent. Uh, I'm like, we need the scholarship, run with it, right? So again, 
right from where you're located, let's start at the center. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna think, yeah, we're really in a beautiful moment um, where we're starting to see these exciting things happening. I think that's a really beautiful place for you to, mm -hmm. end, to <laughs> end here. I'm sorry, we can continue in the, in the um, for it, because we have a reception that everybody's invited to. Um, but that's really, I mean, it is. I'm so excited to actually see your work and others that has just blossomed and really grown <laughs> since I started this little, <laughs> little, you know, it's been incredible. And I really thank you both for, you know, being here this afternoon with us. And and um, let's ca carry on the conversation outside. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.